May 29, 1943, RAF Alconbury, England. Seven heavily modified YB-40 Flying Fortresses of the 92nd Bomb Group's 327 Squadron sat quietly on the dispersal stands while their crews completed the final pre-flight checks before their first real mission. These experimental gunships, armed with as many as 1650 caliber machine guns, symbolized the U.S. Army Air Force's desperate attempt to solve the deadly escort problem that was draining the 8th Air Force over Germany. Instead of providing salvation, they would expose a flaw in the B-17S design that had silently claimed American lives since the first raids into occupied Europe. The problem appeared simple but proved lethally deceptive. Two waste gunners stood directly across from each other in the narrow fuselage, firing through open windows on opposite sides. In battle at 25,000 feet, with temperatures plunging to 60 degrees below zero, each man wore layers of sheepskin gear, 30 pounds of flak armor, oxygen masks, and parachutes. Inside that cramped corridor, they crashed into one another while trying to swing their guns toward incoming fighters. Oxygen lines tore loose, hypoxia killed within minutes. Ammunition belts snagged, freezing hands jammed, weapons failed. Many airmen died not from enemy fire, but from the inability to defend themselves because of this basic design oversight. Over the next 18 months, bitter experience, engineering discipline, and industrial urgency would drive one of the most important evolutions in military aviation history. Through data, blood, and invention, the B-17 would change from an exposed target into the most formidably defended bomber of the Second World War. Early 1943 statistics were grim. Operational research showed the average flying fortress survived only 11 combat missions before destruction. Yet a crew needed 25 missions for a complete tour. The math meant a mere 27% chance of survival. Across East Anglia, empty bunks multiplied inside Nissan huts. Personal effects were boxed and shipped to heartbroken families. Replacement crews arrived faster than they could be trained. The crisis had been building since the 8th Air Force began operations in August 1942. Pre-war doctrine, shaped at the Air Corps Tactical School in Alabama, claimed that mass defensive firepower from tight formations would make daylight bombing possible without fighter escorts. In theory, the B-17S overlapping arcs would protect the formation. In practice, German fighter groups flying Focke-Wulf 190s and Messerschmitt Bf 109s learned to exploit every weakness. The waste gun stations, designed in peacetime, became the fortress's Achilles heel. At that position, the fuselage barely measured 10 feet wide. Two men, standing face to face, tried to pivot in opposite directions while wrapped in thick suits and burdened with gear. Collisions were inevitable. Meanwhile, 200 mile per hour slipstreams howled through open windows. Metal froze, oxygen regulators clogged with ice, gloves stiffened like boards. Clearing a jam with bare fingers often cost the gunner his flesh. Combat reports from winter 1943 confirmed the chaos. In January's raid on Wilhelmshaven, the first American attack on Germany itself, waste gunners complained they could hardly move or aim without striking each other. During March's strike on the U-boat facilities at Kiel and the ball-bearing plants at Erkner, gunners became entangled and left their flanks undefended. The interim solution was bold. Transform the bomber into its own escort. In September 1942, Lockheed's Vega Division received orders to convert standard B-17FS into YB-40 flying gunships. Engineers replaced single waist mounts with twin guns, installed an extra dorsal turret, fitted a Bendix chin turret, plated vital areas with armor, and converted the bomb bay into a massive ammunition storage carrying 11,000 rounds. When the first 13 YB-40S arrived at Alconbury in May 1943, expectations were high. Reality struck fast. The extra guns and armor made the planes heavier. Once the standard bombers dropped their loads, the YB-40S lagged behind. Worse yet, the twin-gun waste setup worsened the interference problem. The debut mission on May 29, 1943, against the submarine pens at St. Nazir, proved disappointing. Post-mission debriefs listed coordination failures and wasted coverage from the waste guns. Less than a month later, tragedy confirmed the design flaw when YB-40 serial 425735 went down over hulse after its gunners failed to cover the beam due to mutual obstruction. Reports from squadron, 
command, and manufacturer converged on one urgent issue. At Wright Field in Ohio, the Air Technical Service Command began analysis. In Seattle, Boeing's chief engineer Edward Curtis Wells gathered a team to interpret the combat data. Douglas Aircraft in Tulsa and United Airlines Modification Center in Cheyenne began physical experiments on test airframes. The eventual solution was stunningly practical. Move one window forward, slide the other backward, staggering them by three feet. Each gunner would get his own working zone, free from elbows, oxygen hoses, and tangled ammo belts. The structure required minimal alteration but promised greatly improved performance. The first test B-17 with staggered waste windows flew in July 1943. Results came instantly. Gunners could now swing through full firing arc smoothly, and the rate of internal interference dropped almost to zero. Yet exposure to gale force wind and cold remained. Engineers answered that too, enclosing the stations with plexiglass panels featuring rotating gun mounts. This became known as the Cheyenne configuration and it turned the waste section from a liability into a combat-worthy post. Douglas implemented the staggered window modification on late-production B-17F aircraft beginning in August 1943. Boeing integrated it immediately into the new B-17G series. The first G rolled out on August 30th. Lockheed Vega followed soon after. The G model embodied every major combat lesson of 1943. The new Bendix chin turret plugged the frontal blind spot. The tail received broader windows and improved sights. Together, these evolved features produced the most formidable bomber gun defense of the war. Production numbers signaled total commitment. Boeing's Seattle plant turned out 8,680 G models. Douglas Long Beach built 2,395, and Lockheed Vega added 2,250, all with the offset waste and enclosed stations. Autumn 1943 combat proved the results. In October's raids on Bremen and Vegsack, the modified fortresses claimed far more kills with fewer losses than older F models. Beam attacks, once devastating, now faltered against seamless arcs of gunfire. October 14, 1943, Black Thursday, the second Schweinfurt raid. 60 B-17S were shot down from 291 cent, but analysis showed that the newer G models suffered proportionally fewer losses. Their enhanced defense was changing outcomes even amid catastrophe. Luftwaffe reports confirmed this shift. Major Hans Philipp noted that American bombers had become markedly harder to attack. Waste gunners fired with control and accuracy across an attacker's full approach path. German pilots begun to rely on standoff rocket mortars and heavily armored Sturm Staffel assault fighters, proof that the Allied redesign forced a tactical rethink. By December 1943, this evolution reshaped Allied strategy itself. The 8th Air Force could now plan deep strike missions knowing survivability had improved dramatically. General Ira Eaker reported to General Henry Arnold that the new modifications materially enhanced strategic operations capability. The transformation extended from metal to doctrine. Gunnery schools rewrote their manuals. Instructors at Kingman Army Airfield in Arizona demonstrated that staggered positions allowed genuine deflection shooting, something impossible with the old layout. Other aircraft adopted the idea. Late model B-24 Liberators received offset waste stations, and the next generation B-29 incorporated fully enclosed, remotely controlled turrets eliminating exposure entirely. The lineage of defensive ergonomics traced directly to the B-17G's waste redesign. January 11, 1944 showed the cumulative impact. 600 fortresses attacked German aircraft plants. Despite incomplete escort, losses remained modest, and most shootdowns involved older F models. The G proved notably resilient. In February's Big Week Offensive, over 3,000 bomber sorties pounded Germany's aircraft industry. Resistance was fierce, but loss rates finally fell within sustainable bounds. For the first time, the attrition balance between attacker and defender had decisively tilted toward the Allies. New 8th Air Force Commander Lieutenant General James Doolittle recognized what these strengthened G models meant. He released escorts like the P-51 Mustang from close formation duty, allowing them to sweep ahead and hunt German fighters freely. Together, these tactics shattered Luftwaffe's strength. 
On March 4, 1944, American bombers struck daylight at Berlin for the first time. 730B17S and B24S roared toward the Nazi capital. The 95th Bomb Group, flying B17Gs, lost only three airplanes yet claimed 17 enemy fighters downed. 200 German interceptors failed to dent the column. By spring, thousand bomber raids became routine. The fortified waste positions helped make large-scale sustained operations possible, supporting the destruction of the Reich's oil and transportation networks. During the invasion of Normandy in June 1944, the Eighth Air Force flew over 2,000 bomber sorties in support. Only 26 aircraft were lost from all causes, a testament to improved protection and tactics. The B-17G had evolved into a reliable, battle-tested weapon platform. By that summer, the Luftwaffe faced an impossible equation. The Allies could replace every loss immediately, and each replacement carried improved defenses. Every surviving bomber required multiple German fighters to destroy, producing heavier German attrition with each engagement. Survival statistics told the story. In early 1943, finishing 25 missions was nearly hopeless. By mid-1944, crews routinely completed tours of 35. The average life expectancy of both plane and crew had more than doubled. August 1944 brought validation from the enemy itself. German intelligence reports on crashed B-17Gs noted how the offset waste configuration delivered effective beam coverage. The transformation from vulnerable target to lethal fortress was complete. Boeing's Plant 2 in Seattle employed 44,000 workers producing 16 B-17Gs every day at the program's peak. The synergy of feedback, redesign, and mass production created a weapon system evolving faster than Germany could counter. By October 1944, the modified fortresses were even damaging fast jet fighters. During engagements with the Mi-262, waste gunners scored hits despite the jet's speed advantage. In December came proof of dominance. On Christmas Eve, 2034 bombers launched the largest airstrike of the war. Even against desperate defenses, proportional losses were lower than those suffered in much smaller raids the previous year. On February 3, 1945, nearly a thousand B-17S bombed Berlin. Only 21 failed to return. What had once been catastrophic had become acceptable attrition. The last B-17G left the Seattle assembly line on April 13, 1945, serial 4485974, the final embodiment of combat-driven engineering. Just days later, on April 25, 1945, Flying fortresses struck Czech arms factories with zero losses. The design evolution had reached its conclusion. Field reports across the 8th Air Force confirmed that the improvements, particularly the staggered waste, had saved lives and secured mission success. After the war, the United States Strategic Bombing Survey credited the B-17S incremental transformations for helping achieve air superiority over Europe. The human factor insight of offset positions, protective enclosures, and improved fields of fire became foundational in post-war aircraft design. Financial analysis delivered numerical proof. Less than $20 million in modifications prevented the destruction of over 800 aircraft worth close to 200 million, preserving thousands of veteran crew members. The investment paid for itself more than 10 times over. Every combat aircraft that followed, jet or propeller, carried lessons from the revamped Flying Fortress. Engineers now prioritized crew workspace, environmental control, and ergonomics as seriously as weapon caliber. Human survivability was design, not decoration. Veterans themselves bore the testimony. At reunions decades later, waste gunners compared memories. The claustrophobic F model and the newly staggered G. One let us breathe, they said. The other let us fight. Today, only a dozen B-17Gs still fly. Visitors who look through those offset windows learn that innovation often begins in suffering. They see how factory engineers, line mechanics, and frontline airmen collaborated unconsciously across an ocean and built an evolutionary loop no enemy could match. General Carl Spatz expressed it best. The B-17G was not designed in laboratories or boardrooms, but in combat. Every improvement came from observation, courage, and adaptation above a hostile continent.
The story of those staggered waste windows is the story of American innovation under fire, simple changes, profound results, victory through adaptation. That is how the Flying Fortress earned its name and how it helped win the air war over Europe.